Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. It is time for our monthly edition of What's New at Ancestry. This is for September 2017. If you've never joined us for a What's New episode before, we're going to quickly cover some of the upcoming events where you can meet Ancestry employees, where you can have a genealogy education experience, and then we're going to talk about the new content that's been released onto the site this past month. I'll show you some tips and tricks for navigating that content and uh, give you some explanation about what's included. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's start first with the events that are coming up for the remainder of 2017 that we just finished the Federation of Genealogical Societies annual conference. It was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania this year. We uh, wrapped that up on Saturday evening. So now we are looking forward to the Pinners Conference in Dallas, Texas, coming up at the end of this month. That'll be the 29th and 30th of September. Now, this is not a genealogy-specific conference. It's a conference for people who use Pinterest. So if you are a fan of that social media platform, it's a great place to go to get ideas. There's lots of craft and, and um, decorating ideas and like cooking and just anything you can think of. But Ancestry will have a booth there where we will be doing um, lookups for people, giving people some assistance with family history on some computers we'll have set up there. And then I will also be teaching a couple of classes, uh, one on family history, one on uh, Ancestry DNA. So if you live in the Dallas area or are interested in that event, you can learn more at pinnersconference.com. Then our international friends um, out of our Dublin office and our London office will be headed to Back to Our Past. That's the big genealogy conference coming up the 20th, 21st, and 22nd of October in Dublin. So be sure to check that out if you uh, are going to be in or near the Dublin area uh, toward the end of October, or if that's uh, something of interest to you. Now, these are just the big events where Ancestry is going to be in attendance and have a presence at that event. There are dozens and dozens of local genealogical societies and state societies that are going to have events. Um, every month they have meetings, sometimes they have larger events. I think, um, for example, I'll be speaking at the Central Florida Genealogical Society. They're having their big annual conference the first weekend of November. Um, so I'll be at that event speaking. Um, but you can keep up with most of those uh, at this really great website. It's conferencekeeper.org. Just uh, lists all of the events and, and things that might be more local to you that would be useful for you to attend to further your own genealogy education. If you've never been to a genealogy conference or uh, spent time at, at a genealogy society, I just strongly encourage you to take that plunge. The, there's nothing quite like in-person, face-to-face, hands-on learning opportunities and networking opportunities to further your genealogy education and to keep you growing your family tree. So that is the events for 2017. Now, you're gonna, if you want to look ahead to events for 2018, some of us are heading into um, you know, scheduling and planning for next year and budgeting for next year. Uh, so here are the major events, the, the five major conferences that Ancestry will be in attendance at. The first one, of course, is the largest genealogical conference in the world. It is Roots Tech. It's held in Salt Lake City every year. This year, it will be a little bit later than it has been in the past four or five years. Uh, it's going to be held the 28th of February through the 3rd of March. Thousands of people come from all over the world, hundreds of classes and opportunities and vendors and just so much great learning happening there. Uh, and so be sure to check that out. If you just do a quick internet search for Roots Tech, you should find all the details. The National Genealogical Society's annual conference will be held in Grand Rapids in May. Of course, SoCal Genealogy Jamboree, which we just adore, is in Burbank every year. And then uh, the IAJGS, the Jewish Gen International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies, is headed to Warsaw, Poland next year in August. And then the Federation of Genealogical Societies in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And if you've never been to Fort Wayne, certainly something to look forward to. It is the second largest genealogical library in the world. So you're going to want to maybe even plan a day or two before or a day or two after, uh, after you've learned all the things you need to learn, that you can then head over to the library in, there in Fort Wayne and apply those things. So those are the events coming up for next year. Of course, there's going to be lots of smaller events 
uh, be sure to check those out. Now, let's talk about new content online at Ancestry this month. Every month, Ancestry adds new records in new databases, and uh, we do a ton of work and we try to get a variety of records from around the world and from different time periods. And that's what I think you're going to see this month as we've got um, a breadth of both location and time period included in the new record collections this month. Now, if you're not sure how to locate the new record collections, if you go to search on Ancestry and go down to the card catalog, it's my favorite thing on our whole website, you can then sort the card catalog by date added, and that will put all the new stuff at the top of the list. So you can just kind of quickly skim through. And you'll see here we've got stuff from the U.S. and Canada and England and Germany and um, you know, Australia. Lots of different records from all over this month. And some of these records date back to the 1500s, and some of them come down as far as 2011. So let's just take a look at a few of these specific databases. We're going, we don't have time to cover them all, I wish we did, but uh, we're going to talk first about the Sydney Australia Anglican Parish Registers. So uh, these are very specific to, the, to a location in Australia, so it's not all of New South Wales, it is just Sydney, and they are church records. Church records um, prior to government registration of birth, marriage, and death. Um, church records are one of the only ways you're going to be able to trace your family back through time. And so these are really valuable. They date back to 1818. Now, just because the government started keeping records doesn't mean that the churches stopped. And so these go all the way through 2011. So if we just um, hop over here to this database, you're going to see a couple of things that I just want to point out. First is there's a browse box over here. That browse box usually means that there are images attached to this collection of records. So one of the benefits of the browse box is that it allows you to just quickly go in and see if the church that your family may have belonged to is included in this collection. So you could just search and search and search by name for your family members, but if the church they went to isn't included, then you're gonna get a little bit frustrated probably searching and searching. So sometimes it's useful to just hop over here to this browse and check and see if the church that they attended is even included. If it is, then of course, go ahead and search away. So again, these are um, parish registers. Parish registers typically are going to include um, christenings, marriages, and burials. So it's a little bit um, slightly different than births, marriages, and deaths, but christenings typically will reference the birth date. Marriages, of course, um, uh, the marriage date is included, and then burials will typically reference the death date. So while the, while the governments uh, of certain countries and locations tend to, um, tend to record the births, marriages, and deaths, churches tend to record christenings or baptisms, marriages, and burials. And that's what you're going to find here in this collection of Sydney records. There are, I believe, if I remember correctly, 1.8 million records in that single collection. So lots and lots of really rich content and fun discoveries to be made there. Next up is actually an, a couple of books that have been indexed by the community who is participating in the World Archives Project. Now that's something that any one of you can participate in. Uh, you just go in and you, they have batches of images that you can download and you can index those. And any of the records that are indexed by the World Archives Project are made available on Ancestry for free. So you do not have to have an active subscription to access this specific database because it was indexed by the, by the World Archives Project community. Now, uh, the reason that this set of records is so exciting, it's the Maryland Catholic Families, uh, and it's again from a, from a couple of books. And if you scroll down past the search box, you're going to see the source information. And this is true on any database on Ancestry. And you'll be able to see here the books that were included in this particular database or that were indexed for this database. Now, there's a couple of, like I said, a couple of, of reasons why this is exciting to me. One is because it goes back to 1753. And uh, most of you know that in the United States, the federal census didn't start until 1790. It was not an every name index uh, until 1850. Prior to that, only the head of household was listed. And so really prior to 1850 in the United States, 
trying to find details about individuals is a little bit of a challenge. Certainly not impossible. We've got family histories that go back um, you know, into the 17 and 1600s that people have spent decades putting together. But this is another resource for people who are looking for information about people prior to 1850. Now, one of the reasons it focuses on Catholic families, you may not know that, uh, that Maryland was the, was the location of the first Catholic church here in the New World. And so uh, really the Catholic church spread out from Maryland across the country here in the United States. And so we've got these core groups of families who started in Maryland, built up the church, and then moved their way westward and southward, southward down into Kentucky and um, you know, westward up into Ohio. And so you've got um, these core families or these, some of these original families that are essentially the ancestors of a large number of Catholic families throughout the United States. And of course, not all of their descendants uh, remained Catholic, and so uh, some of us can trace our, our heritage back to some of these original Catholic families, um, even if we are not currently um, Catholics. So uh, religion, you're, I hope you're catching this idea, right? Which is that religion to our ancestors was a big deal. The church that they associated with, the people that they affiliated with in their community often revolved around their religious beliefs. And so coming to understand that about your ancestors not only gives you an insight into who they were and maybe why they made some of the choices that they made, but it's also going to lead you very directly to the records that are going to help tell the story. So it doesn't matter if they're Catholic or if they're from the Church of England or if they're, you know, Anglican, like the, well, Anglican, um, like the Australian records we just looked at, or um, I have family that was Quaker in New Jersey back in the 1700s. And so, you know, understanding what faith they affiliated themselves with will help lead you to specific records. Again, you've got this browse box over here that can uh, you can use, or you can just jump right in and start searching these particular records. Next up is another set of colonial um, time period records, which is um, super exciting to me. I have family in colonial Virginia, and anytime there are new records that come online for that time period, I'm digging in to see if I can break through one of my genealogical brick walls that I've been unable to get past. Now, these records are a little bit different, so I'm gonna have to explain it and, and pay attention. Again, there's always a database description you can see we, these records were obtained from the Library of Virginia. Um, that's in the source information, and then the database description gives you more details. Let me just give you kind of the rundown. So these records date from 1607 to 1853. Now, one of the challenges of doing research in colonial Virginia is that a lot of the records have been lost or destroyed over time um, because of conflicts, you know, the Revolutionary War, the, the Civil War, we've got record loss that occurred. Um, and then also, if you think about it, prior to the Revolutionary War, uh, Virginia was a colony. It was not part of the United States. And so a lot of the records that were created for colonial Virginia in particular through the 16 and 1700s were not owned by Virginia. They were owned by uh, England in particular. And so... Back in the 1950s, there was a consortium of organizations, the Library of Virginia, um, the State Genealogical Society, and others, who decided that they were going to survey or catalog all of the records held by archives in Europe that pertained to Virginia. Hope that makes sense, <laughs> okay? So basically what they've done, or, uh, and what they compiled here, that Ancestry has then digitized and made searchable here online is a catalog of record information um, or of information about records that are held in archives in Europe. So I can come in here and I can do a name search. So here's, you know, William Jefferson, for example, and I've got this little listing here, this little index here that tells me that these records are from 1675 to 1676. They're in Whitby. Um, there's a little bit of a comment here that says something about being a master of a ship. So that's a clue, again, that I might have the right William Jefferson out of all the William Jeffersons. And then when you click through to view the image, what you're actually going to be looking at is a survey record. So this is 
a survey report that gives me information about um, holdings in a particular archive. And so I'm going to need to then understand what this survey points me to in order to understand where to go to find the additional records. Now I can navigate my way through these images just like any other records. And if you go back to the first image, what you discover is that survey report number 3971, where this particular William Jefferson was found, is a, um, a list of records. And here's the information about those records and the dates and the title of those records and where those records are held. So it gives me information, again, about where to go to find the original records, but the records themselves are not online. So I hope that makes sense. What we're looking at is, again, just a survey or a catalog of records that are found pertaining to colonial Virginia in archives around Europe. I think this is fantastic. Again, indexes just in general are designed to be a finding aid. And if I find that I you know, have a whole bunch of records at a particular location in some archive like the Public Records Office or elsewhere around the world, um, it might be worth making a research trip there or hiring a professional genealogist who works out of that archive to pull those records for me so that I can have access to that additional information that's going to help me keep climbing and growing my family tree. So Virginia Colonial Records, fantastic resource. Okay, next up we have uh, some extracted Church of England parish registers. Uh, these are specifically for Shropshire, England. And then like most parish registers in England, they date back to 1538, which is just fantastic. They only go through 1812. So for those of you who are familiar with English research, you know that the government didn't start keeping birth, marriage, and death records until 1837. So a lot of times we'll see a little bit of overlap with the parish registers and the, um, the general registers office records, but here we actually have a gap. So these ones only go through 1812, uh, but they are through, uh, begin in 1538. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that these are extracted Church of England parish records, which means somebody has extracted the information off the original image and provided this data to Ancestry. You'll notice over here on the right-hand side, there is no browse box. That means there are no images attached to this set of records. So you are just looking at an extraction. And again, if you read the source information, you'll have what you need uh, to be able to work your way back to the original image. But you'll notice here again, no image is attached. They've just extracted the information out of whatever particular record that was. And if you want access to the original, um, be sure to read the source information and the database description to get that. Now, why would we want the original? For those of you who are a little bit newer to genealogy, one of the things uh, that that may be new information to you. Uh, and the reason you might want the original is because, well, for a lot of reasons. One is because anytime a record is copied, then there is introduced room for error, right? Names get mistranscribed, dates get transposed, um, you know, lots of things that can happen. So working your way back to the original will make sure you have the most accurate information. The other reason is very often the original, especially in context, sometimes holds more information information that's not available in just the, the extraction or the transcription that was used to create the index. So hopefully that makes sense to uh, most of you. Okay, next up we have again another set of church records. This time they are for Saskatchewan, Canada. They are Catholic birth, marriage, and death records, and they date from 1867 through 1932. Now this is important because um, here uh, in, well, in Canada, here in Canada, like I'm in Canada, um, <laughs> I was in Canada this summer. Um, so in Canada, um, they have a little bit stricter privacy laws than the United States does when it pertains to their census. So the most recently available census here in the United States is 1940, but the most recently available census in Canada is 1921. So anytime we get access to records that are after that 1921 time period, that's just a really great opportunity for those of us who have ancestors or relatives who are in Canada 
um, particularly for those of us who are just getting started on a, on a family tree or um, maybe don't know a lot about our grandparents or great grandparents, then that's an opportunity to dig into more recent records. And so these records go through 1932, which is really fantastic. Uh, I spent some time this summer with a lot of people who were brand new to family history and having the opportunity to see what they know and what they don't know. It was a really eye-opening experience for me because I've been doing family history for so long, it's sometimes really easy to forget that there are people who literally do not know the maiden names of either of their grandmothers or whose grandparents, like I worked with a lot of young people this summer, their grandparents were born, are still, are all still alive. Um, and all still, you know, born um, maybe after 1940, some of them even after 1950. And so the trick to ancestry, of course, is that you have to be looking for somebody who is deceased or somebody who was born prior to these privacy laws being put into place in order to find access to some of those records. Um, it's amazing to me how often people come to ancestry and search for themselves or for their, their parents because they haven't quite yet grasped that concept that, you have to be looking for somebody who would be included in a record set that has been made publicly available. So again, for Canada, Catholic baptisms, marriages, and burials, these are great records. They date back to 1867, which is fantastic, and they go all the way through 1932, which is also really great. Okay, uh, last but certainly not least, we have a collection of 5 million New York death records that have been made available. These uh, date from 1880 through 1956. Now, there is a little bit of a nuance here that I want to make sure people understand, which is this database is a New York death index. However, you will notice a browse box over here. And now I said a browse box means there are images attached. And that is true. There are images attached. However, the images are for the state index. Okay? So these are not images of original death certificates or death registers. These are images of the state's index. So there are images but they are images just to the index. Now that's still super useful because again, anytime information is copied, it opens up room for error. So you always wanna check the original image where it's available. But what you're looking for in this case is to verify that the name and the dates and the certificate number in particular are accurate because that certificate number is what you're going to need when you contact the New York Department of Health in Albany to get access to the original certificate. So the index is what the state of New York has allowed us to put online, uh, but that index can and will lead you to an original certificate that you can order directly from the state of New York. So there you go. again, 5 million records in that database. I have not even begun to scratch the surface of playing with it. It's only been online for a few days and I'm excited to see what new doors it opens for me in my own research. Well, that is all I have prepared for you today. Hopefully this was useful information. I am putting together the schedule for videos for the remainder of this month and for into October. So if you have suggestions for topics that you would like me to cover, please email me at ask at ancestry.com with those suggestions and I'll stick them on the list and see if we can't get them prioritized for a future video. Also, you can watch past presentations on our YouTube channel here, and uh, there's a playlist called Desktop Education where we upload all of these videos, and you can access them there for replay. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.